First, I believe that truth as a category does exist. Number two, it is possible in a majority of claims of philosophical and historical statements to verify the truthfulness of those affirmations. Third, I believe there are existential realities from which I cannot run which drive me to find the answers to the existential struggles that I live with, not just the philosophical ones. The philosophical ones are real and I have to deal with them, but so are the existential ones. And by the way, existentialism came as a response to the unpaid bills of philosophy. Philosophy had become so cerebral that the passions had been ignored and existentialism came into being and sort of tossed out the rationalistic way of interpreting things and went purely with the gut level feeling a la Sartre and Camus and so on. But I think what we are trying to do is if we are trying to find the bridge between the head and the heart, there are numerous ways of doing this. And the way you start off with by saying, if you take the Bible as the question, then why the Bible and why not any other system of thought? You start off with uh, the scriptures and ask yourself the question. Here there are 66 books by nearly 40 different authors over 1500 years that are books on history, that are books on philosophical thinking, that are books on theological thinking and systematic thinking. Now if the Bible made several assertions one after another that you found out to be false either historically or philosophically or in the existential realm you go further and further and if you see that kind of systemic contradiction and failure then you have reason to believe that I cannot really trust this document it is not in keeping with the way I'm seeing history and reality but when you look at the scriptures and by the way the Bible is a very distinctive piece of literature to any other religious piece of scripture any Muslim will tell you that his book the Quran is word for word perfect it is a perfect revelation of Allah in the eye of the Muslim. They will affirm that again and again. That's why no translation in, of the Quran will ever do justice in their estimation of the Quran. It is the perfect expression of, uh, of Allah himself as dictated to Muhammad who recited it. Now, the Bible as we, know, as we know it does not affirm that verbal perfection. I actually have a great deal of difficulty with verbal perfection. Are we really saying that no one word would have been better than the other word in, in, these, in the volume of material? But when you take the scriptures disclosed over centuries and over, over 1500 years, as I said, 40 different writers, 66 books, and you see the prophetic schema all the way down to the person of Christ. Let me give you an example of this. The book of Daniel is written in the late 500s before Christ. And yet when you study the book of Daniel, you begin to see the specifics of a fantastic prophecy. He talks about a massive empire that will come into being and how that, uh, that empire will be, will be divided into four and that empire will be led by what they call a strident, strong he-goat from the west who will be marching several nations underfoot but shall be suddenly cut off and his empire will be divided into four. Those four then emerge into two and those two blend into one. When you take the book of Daniel written late 500s and put it pro forma onto Alexander the Great in the 300s before Christ, you see the stridency of Alexander suddenly cut off in his 20s, four kingdoms emerge given to his four generals. Those four come into the two, the Ptolemaic and the Seleucid empires, that emerge then into the Roman Empire. Centuries before to be so specific in prophecy, you go to the prophecy of Zechariah, who describes the crucifixion of Christ. They shall look upon him whom they have pierced and weep as a mother weeps for her only son. You go to the prophecy of Isaiah and see the, how the Christ is going to suffer. Immediately you see the supernatural. Immediately you see the supernatural. So when you take the miraculous element, you take the historic element, you look into the scriptures and you see there is an authenticity and it all points to one perfect person, the person of Christ. Bruce Metzger, who is a scholar from Princeton, made the comment, he said, after you take the 20,000 lines of the New Testament, it is safe for any scholar to say there's at least a 99.6% accuracy. No ancient document, none, 
has the kind of documentary support that the Bible has. Over 5,000 documents or even Time magazine in 88, I think, Richard Osling made the comment. One thing we cannot deny the Christians, he said, is the documentation that is available across the centuries. Nothing in ancient literature matches it. Neither Homer, nor uh, Aeschylus, nor any one of the, nor the Gaelic Wars of Caesar, whatever. So when you've got this kind of documentation, this kind of accuracy, that kind of a person in the person of Christ, I think you've got pretty compelling evidence to see why it is that we need to take Christ very seriously. So he actually denies there is any such thing as evil. I was flying out of a country where I sat next to a woman who rescues women and children from abuse. I won't name the country, but she told me she was a Dutch lady. I said, were you successful? She said, I saw the worst thing I saw last night. She said, in this area of city called Snake Alley, men come at night, they, con they consume a concoction of snake's blood and hard liquor. It ravages the mind and then whatever they want, they are given. She said, I rescued an 18-month-old baby girl from the arms of this man who was sexually plundering her because that's what he wanted under the influence of snakes, blood, and hard liquor. Mr. Dawkins, is that evil? Can you imagine there walk human beings for whom that is pleasure? Is this the ravaging of just the brain or the ravaging of the soul? Dawkins says, no, we're dancing to our DNA. Is that what he was doing? It's easy to come up and say, God is dead, God doesn't exist. How then do you make any moral pronouncements of any kind? We get away from all of this. People like Sam Harris and all who brandish their penmanship like a sword to lacerate Christians and all the wars we've caused. Has he ever counted the millions that atheism has killed? And the difference? In atheism, it can logically emerge. In a transcendent Judeo-Christian worldview, it would have to be in violation of what they believe. The kind of stuff that's going on. He doesn't care that 10 million female babies have been eradicated in India only because they were female. Is this all right? Or is this the human heart displayed in such heartbreaking ways? He describes in Hobart Maurer went to his grave a skeptic. He taught at Johns Hopkins, taught at Harvard, committed suicide at the age of 75. But he wrote to, in Psychology Today, sometime I think in the 70s, he said, you know, when we did away with sin, we lost our definition of ourselves. It's a skeptic saying that. We lost who we were. And it basically boils down to this. There are three steps you take in establishing the existence of God. Now, they have, the person has to listen very carefully because I take them through the three stages. Step number one is this, Jim. However you section physical reality, you take the physical universe as you see it. However you slice it down to its minutest form, the fact of the matter is you end up with a physical entity or quantity that does not have the reason for its existence in itself. Ultimately, the physical universe reduced in any form cannot explain its own origin. It has to find its explanation outside of itself, which means the first explanation of a universe as we see it has to have something that is non-physical as a first cause. So you've got a kind of a haunted universe without knowing what the first cause is. Next you come to the argument for what we call not from design, but to design. And that's what I said, if you walk onto a planet and see a wrapper of a McDonald's hamburger and see letters of an alphabet, you immediately know that there is information there. And logic tells you, Jim, as it tells everybody listening, where you see information, you assume that prior to that information is a mind. You don't just think that Handel's uh, Hallelujah Chorus came together or that the dictionary developed because of an explosion in a printing press. There is sequence to the whole thing. And if you take 
Jim, just the com composition of the enzyme in the human component. The enzyme, which is the building block of the gene, and the gene the building block of the cell. The possibility of the human enzyme coming together by random, says Vikram Singhi, professor of applied mathematics at Cardiff in Wales, the possibility of that happening by chance is 1 in 10 to the power of 40,000. That's more than the number of atoms in this universe. That's amazing. That it is abs it is lot it is time wise and mathematically the possibility is zero. So I say to you number one, the physical quantity cannot explain itself. Number two, there's intelligibility which assumes a prior mind. Number one, in the first case, there is something non physical. Second case, there is something intellectual or a mind. And third, in the history of society, human experience and history itself you begin to realize that the moral issues, the social issues, and just human intercourse demands the explanation of a moral reality. So you've got a first cause that is spiritual, a first cause that is mind, a first cause that needs to explain morality. You take these three struggles, Jim, and now pause with me for a moment here. There are four fundamental questions in life. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. You take these four questions and these three explanations needed, and only God is big enough to explain this universe. When you think about the deepest uh, questions of your own heart and mind, these are the areas that we deal with, particularly four. The question of origin, the question of meaning, the question of morality, and the question of destiny. How did I come to be? How do I find uh, purpose and meaning in life? How do I define and separate right from wrong? And what happens to you or to me when we die? Religion attempts to answer those questions. Now, sometimes you'll get a worldview that may answer one with a fair degree of correspondence to truth. But when you put all four of them together, there needs to be a coherence. What makes Jesus Christ unique and different is in the coherence that he gives to these four answers. You see, the most important thing you need to bear in mind is it is not what was said, but who said it. When you look at the person of Jesus Christ across history, even his staunchest critics will tell you, no one ever lived a life so pure and so much in keeping with what life ought to be and ought to mean. I remember, for example, being in uh, the home of Mahatma Gandhi in central India. And there's a huge banner out there. Now, Gandhi was a Hindu, a pantheist, but the banner was penned by Bertrand Russell, an atheist. And he said this fascinating comment, it is doubtful that Gandhi's effort would have succeeded except he was appealing to the conscience of a Christianized people is the way he worded it. Isn't that fascinating? Here's an atheist commending the efforts of a pantheist saying he succeeded because the conscience of a people he was appealing to was touched by the very person of Jesus Christ. When you look at his life, his purity, his virgin birth, the offer that he made on the cross, bringing together love, forgiveness, and explaining evil, and ultimately rising again from the dead. Very, very different indeed. In fact, so unique that many have said there has never been one in history like him. What they are talking about is that in the complexity of the very being of God, there is an I-you relationship within the Godhead. Now, to go from where we are to where God is, I think it is critical we, we follow this kind of reasoning here. It is this. The greatest search for philosophy of all time has been the search for unity and diversity. The greatest search has been for unity and diversity. The early Greek philosophers were looking at it, and then out comes somebody with four unities, earth, air, water, and fire. So his student comes on the scene and says, wait a minute, those are four, not one. So we coined the word quintessence. What is the fifth essence that unites these four essences? The word university, to find unity in diversity. On every American coin, e pluribus unum. Out of the multiplicity, you find one. Now, how do we explain unity and diversity in the effect, which is what this world is? You and I are part of the effect. We've got unity and diversity in the effect of this universe. 
The only way to explain unity and diversity in the effect is if you've got unity and diversity in the first cause, and only in the Trinity is there unity and diversity in the community of the Trinity. If you do not grant that, you actually have even a bigger problem to deal with. For example, in the Islamic concept of God, which is a monadic concept of Allah, and they, of course, repeatedly throw against the Christian this attitude that we've got a plurality of gods, we've got a plurality of gods. That is not so. The Lord your God is one. In the complexity of the Trinity, there is an I, you, and a relationship in the Godhead himself. If you've got a monadic concept of God apart from the Trinity, then you end up with another philosophical problem. If God ever says he loves, who was he loving before the creation? If God says he speaks, who was he speaking to before the creation? So communication and affection or love is contained in the Godhead right from the beginning. Where God speaks in the community of the Trinity, where God loves in the Christian faith only does love precede life. In every other faith, life precedes love. So we end up defining love on our terms. There is no referent against it. But if you see the love expressed within the concept of the Trinity, and God's, Jesus' prayer was that you and I may be one, even as he and the Father are one. All I will say to you is Mortimer Adler, the great Jewish philosopher who was a latecomer to Christ, said there will have to be majesty and mystery in God himself. And he says to me, the mystery of the Trinity is a revelation of how God is complete in himself, in one being, the three persons as they relate in love and in language. No sophisticated mathematician need to tell the four writers of the Gospels that one and three are not the same. And yet they were hard and purposeful in the reflection of what the doctrine of the Trinity is all about. The Christian faith stresses a lot of love, a lot of forgiveness, and you were just speaking to that gentleman about how he will judge everybody rightly. However, what really troubles me is this. Christian dogmas all you know, concur on this one thing, that all of us are born with this original sin. Correct. This hereditary, like this, this thing that we just inherited from Adam, and we, we, we are just born with it when we're born. However, I look at the Bible, Jesus never mentioned that. In Ezekiel, in the Old Testament, chapter 18, verse 20, the soul that sins shall die, the son shall never bear the inequity of the father, the father will not bear the inequity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon him, and so on. That whole chapter talks about how your righteousness will lead you to, you know, heaven. And then when Jesus talks about it, and he's in the crowd. This one, everybody's asking, him, how do we inherit the kingdom? He brings a little child and puts him on the throne. It says, you have to be as innocent as that child to inherit the kingdom. He never said it. Nothing about original sin, nothing about the Trinity, him being God. He stressed two things that love thy, thy Lord, my Father, and your Father, and love thy neighbor. That's the only thing he came up with. Do you believe everything Jesus said? Sir, I believe that he was born from a virgin. No, 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 let me ask you a question. I know you believe that because you're a Muslim. Yes. I'm asking you if you believe everything Jesus said in the New Testament. I really don't know what to say because when I buy these Bibles with red writings and I go to certain pastors, they tell me the red writing is not really what Jesus said. Okay. And these other people tell me different. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a classic um, sidestep there. But the reality is that when you look at Jesus, you see, first of all, what he said to the people who refused to come to him. He told them that they were of their father, the devil. When he talked about the human condition, he very clearly described it. And you go all the way through the Sermon on the Mount, and you will see that the standard that he set is impossible for any human being to attain. And he said also very clearly, as he, as he described very, very precisely in the, in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 3, 
that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and there is not even one righteous, no, not one. If you believe that statement, you must believe that what the Apostle Paul is telling us there is precisely what he understands the Christian to be, one who is a sinner. Now, the reason you do not believe in the very sinful uh, reality of the human mind and the human fallen condition is because you also do not believe as a Muslim that man is created in the image of God. Isn't that not, is that not right? Yes, it is. Okay, and that therefore you have absolutely at that point no way to even explain the moral framework. So the moral framework that you actually argue about comes to you from where? It comes from the Quran mainly. Okay. However, I do believe in the scriptures. I do believe in the gospel of Jesus. When John talks about the gospel, he says, and he went to this town and he preached the gospel. And Mark talks about Jesus going to this other town and he preached the gospel. That gospel, I believe, came to Jesus' heart from that father. And that's what I truly believe. None of these gospels had any signature of Jesus on it. It's nobody is really certain and it is debated until today whether these gospels are true or not okay you move your say just shifting subjects honey so let me try try to zero in on you and I what I would like to do is quickly show you exactly what it is that Jesus is talking about when he reminds us of uh, these truths in the Sermon on the Mount but as I'm talking to you here's what I want you to try and first explain to me when the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, what do you think that means? I really think that nobody is perfect. That's what I believe. Nobody is perfect? Yes. Okay, Except then God. how do they find forgiveness? Forgiveness is something that only God can grant. That is correct. Yes. So we are on equal keel, or even keel now. There is none righteous, no not one, nobody is perfect, so nobody in his or her condition can inherit the kingdom of God. Only God can make that decision to give it to you. All right? Yes. Jesus says, if any man come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. He that hath the Son has life, he that has not the Son has not life, but shall come into condemnation. When as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of the living God, even to them that call upon his name. Now he goes into that tremendous conversation with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is the ruler and the teacher of the Jews and so on. And he is talking about all that he knows. And Jesus looks at Nicodemus and says, you are a teacher and you don't know that it is impossible for you to get into the kingdom without the new birth, without being born again. And here he makes a very categoric statement that I want to read for you because I think that will answer the question and I trust will at least be on an even keel by that, uh, by that statement. Here it is. As he is dealing with Nicodemus, here he says to Nicodemus here, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. And what he is saying is, everyone born of the flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That spiritual birth needs to take place. And he goes on to say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So my answer to you, honey, is this. You believe none of us is perfect. We are all imperfect. The Bible calls that falling short of the standard of God. So if you don't want to accept the uh, original sin, you then have to explain why none of us is perfect. And none of us has that capacity to be perfect. Original sin basically means that in my own condition, I'm not able to come to God and meet his complete righteousness, no matter how hard I try, and many of them tried. All this means is that in my strength and in my ability, it is impossible for me to attain the kingdom of God. He's made the way, he's provided it, and I would strongly suggest to you that you try and read the Gospel of John 
without taking those red letters over to somebody who tries to tell you that that is not there because when you go back to the Quran the Quran also tells you he never died and therefore he never rose again there is no living historian of the scriptures that I know today who tells me Jesus did not die it's only in the Quran you see it and it's a false statement he died on the cross history demonstrates that and when he died on that cross three days later he rose again he offers you eternal life honey and you are not perfect I am not perfect God is perfect he is the only one and he's giving you his son through whom you and I can be seen as perfect in his sight we've all sinned he provides the way and a new birth is recognized only when that spirit comes and changes what you want to do and I hope that will happen to you one day too. Well, actually a year and a half ago I was asked to speak at the United Nations prayer breakfast. It was the second time they'd asked me to come only this time I marveled at the subject navigating with absolutes in a relativistic world. You get up at 6.30 in the morning to speak on that and then you're told you have 25 minutes and then you're further told you cannot bring religion into it. I said I'll make a deal. 20 minutes, your subject, last five minutes, why I believe in what I do as being the only answer to this struggle. Okay, we agree. So I talked about the search for four absolutes. Evil, justice, love, and forgiveness. How do you define evil? How do you define justice? What is true love? And when you blow it, how are you forgiven? They all nodded their heads. I said, now I want to ask you with five minutes to go. Do you know of one event in the world where these four converged? I said they converged on the cross of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Evil was seen for what it was. Justice was met out by a righteous and a holy God. Love was displayed unparalleled to a point where he looks at a young man and says take care of her she's now your mother a cosmic drama was unfolding and he cared for the one woman who had so nurtured and cared for him and then I said forgiveness that he's willing to wipe your slate clean and forgive you do you know there was an ambassador from one country, I will not name it, it was an atheistic country. They stood in line to shake hands. The president of the UN says, would you come up to my office and please pray for me and my staff? I go up and come. Before that, this man shakes hand. He said, can I talk to you for a moment? He said, I come from an atheistic country. I don't want to come here. I don't want to come here. We don't believe in God. And I wondered why I was here. He said, this morning I find out why I'm here. Pray for me. God revealed in Christ where absolutes converge in an unparalleled way. I am now 56 years old. I wish so much I were where you are as a university student because I squandered those years. I wasted the best years of my university life and I regret it. You've got young brilliant minds. You're in a great university you have the privilege of getting the best intellectual stuff you can get. I want you to know, go for it. Do the best you can. Grow intellectually. Grow emotionally. Become a whole man or a whole woman. Complete. And if you can find the wonder of knowing God, you will find out what a marvelous thing it is to live for him and live in his name. The definition of worship I give to you from Archbishop William Temple. That worship is the submission of all of our nature to God. It's the quickening of conscience by his holiness. Nourishment of mind by his truth. Purifying of imagination by his beauty. Opening of the heart to his love. And submission of will to his purpose. All this gathered up in adoration is the greatest expression of which we are capable. Your greatest expression is not to be a great physicist or a great chemist or a great engineer or a great teacher. Those are all secondary to find the greatest expression of worshiping God in spirit and in truth. 
The book I'm about to finish is called Recapturing the Wonder. When you know God through Jesus Christ and worship him in spirit and in truth, you will recapture the wonder and you'll be a great physicist, better one, because you know who is the author of all physics. And by the way, it is not uncommon in Cambridge today to see Stephen Hawking in an evangelical church every now and then. When he was asked why, he said, maybe I'm on a spiritual pilgrimage. What else can I say now? And I just say to you, with the best of minds and the best of heart, it'll all only take second place when you know who's fashioned you and made you for himself. Learn to worship him. That will give you meaning in life and everything spokes out of that. I've seen...